Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Thursday, May 12th, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, law enforcement professionals say that the fear of going viral impacts their work. To that, I quote Stephen Colbert, if you're doing nothing wrong, you have nothing to hide from the giant surveillance apparatus the government's been hiding. After that, veterans speak out about problems in the military and why the new film Amerigeddon is so important. That's next. Well, we've been witnessing a lot of political infighting this election cycle, and none of that has been more evident as the recent infighting with the Republican Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, refusing to back Donald Trump. Well, it seems like all of that has changed after the two met this week in D.C. They released a joint statement um, saying that they decided it's really important that the party unites around their shared principles. Apparently, they had a great conversation. Uh, they were honest about their few differences while recognizing that there's also many important areas of common ground. Now, the speaker called this meeting a positive step, but he was quick to say that he still hasn't endorsed Donald Trump yet. But it seems as though Donald Trump still has the edge here in this meeting. We know that's how he kind of goes into these business deals because the millions of voters who are backing Trump, uh, they want immigration enforcement and fair trade deals. And this is key because these are uh, both things which Ryan has worked against. Joining me now is InfoWars writer Kit Daniels. Now, Kit, is Ryan going to stop moving against Donald Trump behind closed doors? And what is the deal? Why won't he or Vicente Fox back Trump? <laughs> Well, it certainly seems like Vicente Fox and Paul Ryan, they love violent illegals more so than Trump. And here's why. Uh, Vicente Fox, he's a good example of a globalist. Back, I believe, in 2005, during the George W. Bush administration, he was lobbying the White House to go public about the North American Union, which is a plan by the globalists to practically erase the borders between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Pretty much kind of like the, North, uh, the, excuse me, the European Union is today. And so you had Vicente Fox though, speaking publicly, you know, advocating the North American Union. The White House even had to tell him to shut up because they didn't want it to be leaked so publicly at that time. So you have Vicente Fox, of course, he's, now he's flipping what Donald Trump off and going out against Trump's wall. And, but here's the thing, the globalists, they love open borders because they can use it to manufacture crises. For example, you saw in Turkey last year, they were shipping arms for ISIS into Syria. That's because Syria had no control over its border. So, of course, it's easy for Turkey to just go into the country and ship whatever arms they want. So that allows them to create these manufactured crises to expand the size, the scope of the government and to fuel exploitable hysteria. So, of course, the globalists and, you know, from a libertarian standpoint, open borders are good. But, you know, you kind of have to have the U.S. and Mexico, you know, kind of like libertarian uh, communities, countries, if you will. So, you know, it's like you can't, you can't really have open borders when you have a global elite that's exploiting that to expand government. Now, I'm going to have a video report on why the globalists hate Trump's wall on Resistance News on YouTube. So check it out. Thank you, Kit. And it'll be really interesting to see just what sort of shared ideas and principles those two have in common. Now, if you're curious about this inviting and, of course, the gridlock, well, it's nothing new. And in fact, it's the name of the game. And now an anonymous congressman is writing a tell-all book. This is going to be coming out in a couple of weeks. Uh, but he, he says these are the confessions of the congressman. This is what's really going on behind closed doors. Their main job is to keep their job, to get reelected. They say it takes precedence over everything. He doesn't even have time to read the bills that he signs. He's too busy out there shaking hands with the lobbyists and putting on the nice suit and tie and hugging the babies and stuff, trying to get reelected. That's all they care about. Uh, they, he also says that the, the, the way that they feel about it is that voters are incredibly ignorant. They know little about our form of government and how it works. And it's far easier than you think to manipulate a nation of naive, self-absorbed sheep who crave instant gratification. Now, the author is remaining anonymous, but he is a Democrat in Congress who laid out his complaints to a longtime friend and former Capitol Hill staffer who then has edited these into a book. So if you want to kind of peel back the curtain even more and see how your elected officials are representing you and what they really think about you when they're feeding you all of this bull, 
year after year, cycle after cycle, and then just shaking hands and making promises that they know that they don't intend to follow through. Uh, one of the quotes out of the book is, voters claim they want substance and detailed position papers, but what they really crave are cutesy cat videos, celebrity gossip, top 10 lists, reality TV shows, tabloid tripe, and on and on. And so this is, you know, this is how they really feel, but frankly, this is what they feed people. And of course, people want to watch their cute cat videos because it gets them out of their abysmal lives that they are living. But this is what the entertainment industry does. Uh, we recently just had a really epic interview with Billy Corgan, and he was dropping a lot of knowledge. And that's what we want to bring to you is a lot of truth and information. What happens? You put out this solid information that's going to actually educate the voters out there and immediately your establishment, uh, media outlets, and other places set about to tear down that information. The issue with this, um, the Billy Corgan interview became the top trending story on Facebook today. And r really the issue is that <laughs> these media outlets had such a hard time ripping it apart. They couldn't even find their angle with it because it was just so good. And that's the thing that's just really upsetting is that they couldn't allow people to watch this video and say, wow, you know, that was, he was dropping a lot of knowledge. It, and it is time for us to have a real conversation about what's happening in this country. And it is very important that free speech is under attack. And you know what, perhaps these Bernie supporters do need to take a long, hard look in the mirror and see if this fascism, uh, these fascist tactics that they're engaging in to shut down free speech is really what they're gonna want in the long term. And it was just a very powerful interview. And so that right there is just a clear indicator of, of these sort of nefarious actors in the government who wanna control people and tell you you're too stupid to know the truth. Go get on your Twitter message and go look at your cat videos because that's all your little pea brains are capable of understanding. Of course, we know they're not speaking to any of us here. And the movie that we are actually going to be speaking with the director as well as the producer of Amerigeddon, Alex Jones, is featured in this movie as well. This movie is total truth. If you really think you can handle it, this movie puts it in your face. And this is something, it deals with something that our congressmen who are too busy trying to get reelected, they don't even look at the bills and they're clearly not even concerned about one of the major things that is facing this country, one of the most devastating things uh, that we are absolutely not prepared for is if the grid goes down, if there is an EMP attack that what could perhaps uh, take down the grid and fully wreck this country. Now, the executive producer and the director joined Alex on the Alex Jones Show today to talk about their movie, Amerigeddon, and also breaking down the fact that there are nefarious actors within our government who not only know that we really need to be concerned about the grid going down, but in fact, some of them don't even care. And why did we do it? Well, we wanted to warn people, but the other thing, and you brought this up, was is that there's a, a criminal elite in Washington, D.C. who are bought and paid for. Uh, 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 these people are controlling our country. You can call it the shadow government to the deep state. And Americans know that and they're ready to hear it, but no one will, will, will reflect their view. Sorry. Well, the Donald Trump movement is what this is about. We're going to skip this break. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm interrupting you know, too much. The, the American people have realized, they've, they've awakened that our country has been stolen. And here's Donald Trump raising up and saying, I'm going to... I'm going to lead the move to take our country back. That's why Donald Trump is resonating. There's all these populist waves coming in. And sure, you've been a patriot for 30, 40 years. You've been brought up one. Mm -hmm. We're, we're, we're kind of old timers at this. But isn't it exciting to see our ideas, our understanding being validated and proven? Fluoride really is bad for your brain. Hey, there really is a world government. Hey, uh, you know, there really is an Illuminati. Uh, hey, they really are establishing Sharia law in areas of Europe. Everything we've warned people about global governance, the attack on the family, 9-11 uh, and our government working with the Saudis, it's all coming out. It's amazing. We live Please continue. I'm ranting. It's just the points oh, you yeah. make are so good. Yeah, and, and I'm tempted to, too, because I'm so excited. Do it. Do it. Go wild. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited about this. You know, you missed vaccines and you missed uh, 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 military industrial complex. I mean, everything. Yeah. The, 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 the corporatists have have bought and paid for this country. You know, this Trans-Pacific Partnership, and that was part of the, of how I outed Cruz. Any of our politicians, and many of them, and I'm a big former Republican donor, 
Uh, the Republicans signed into the law the fast-tracking of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And what you need to know about that is, number one, is any of our politicians that thought the TPP was a good idea are traitors to this country. That law uh, uh, or that tr uh, trade agreement uh, takes away the sovereignty of nations and states and gives it over to a tribunal of corporate attorneys who all they have to do is determine that a corporation has been harmed financially from the act of a, of we a government. We got proven right about corporate world government. Here it is. And they call yep. it global government. And the Pope calls it world government. What do you think is happening? I mean, 100 years from now, what will they call this time in history? Well, they're either going to call it the Great Awakening or the Great Disaster. You know, I am definitely afraid that they're going to kill Trump. Trump is such a threat to the power and the wealth uh, 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 in a, uh, of, of these people that are that are owned by the elitist that uh, I don't know how you know you know you're familiar with MK Ultra mind control. You sure, know, I'm terrified they're going to have one of these guys come in and, and knock him out. And and Mike and I were talking about this today. Will the American people really rise up and take their country back? I don't know. You know, you cut the head off of of, of something, uh, it, it usually dies. And I think they know that. And if they'll kill a sitting president, John F. Kennedy, what will they do to, to, to simply... I agree. Imagine, that was just a few minutes of a very powerful interview with Alex Jones. These two worked for about two years on the movie Amerigeddon. So you're going to get all sorts of information in there. That's opening in theaters across the nation today, tonight actually, at midnight. So be sure and buy your ticket. Everybody needs to go out there and let Hollywood know that this is the kind of content that we want on our screens. And yes, indeed, we can handle the truth. My very powerful interview is coming up with those two next. And then Joe Biggs will be interviewing two former Navy SEALs punished for trying to exercise their rights. Community organizing, Supreme Commander President Barack Obama hates America so much that even as a lame duck president, he intends on taking one last cheap shot at the success of the American dream. Obama and Julian Castro, Obama's Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, in some kind of ongoing, lightly reported, bizarre social Agenda 21 experiment, aimed to punish the suburbs of America for all of the hard work that fueled their position in life. Ours is a nation like no other. A place where great journeys can be made in a single generation. No matter who you are or where you come from, the path is always forward. The New York Post writes, Hillary's rumored running mate, Housing Secretary Julian Castro, is cooking up a scheme to reallocate funding for Section 8 housing to punish suburbs for being too white and too wealthy. The scheme involves supersizing vouchers to help urban poor afford higher rents in pricey areas such as Westchester County, while assigning them government real estate agents called mobility counselors to secure housing in the exurbs. Julian Julian Castro, who the left is seeing as their Obama 2.0 and Hillary's VP, was handpicked by the Obama administration in 2014 from his position as mayor of San Antonio, Texas, to oversee Obama's social experimentation on the housing of America. Castro was highly criticized for the sale of thousands of foreclosed homes to Wall Street firms at bargain basement prices using HUD's Distressed Assets Stabilization Program. 98% of those homes were sold to Wall Street. Castro had been brought in to assist Obama's 2013 forced diversity HUD ruling, where Agenda 21 would receive a tremendous steroid shot, resulting in, as Stanley Kurtz, author of Spreading the Wealth, How Obama is Robbing the Suburbs to Pay for the City's Rights, the new HUD rule is really about changing the way Americans live. It is part of a broader suite of initiatives designed to block suburban development, press Americans into hyper-dense cities, and force us out of our cars. Government-mandated ethnic and racial diversification plays a role in this scheme, yet the broader goal is forced economic integration. The ultimate vision is to make all neighborhoods more or less alike, turning traditional cities into ultra-dense Manhattans, while making suburbs look more like cities do now. In this centrally planned utopia, steadily increasing numbers will live cheek by jowl and stack and pack high-rises close to public transportation, while 
automobiles fall into relative disuse. The Hill reports, in June 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled 5-4 to four that federal housing laws allows people to challenge zoning laws and other housing practices that have a disparate or harmful impact on minority groups, even if there is no proof that the discrimination was intentional. And two weeks after that Supreme Court ruling, HUD issued a regulation intended to help poor people move into communities that are rich with opportunity, as HUD Secretary Castro phrased it at the time. And now, a settlement agreement with Baltimore County, Maryland is making those fanatically utopian policies come to fruition. Due to a complaint filed with HUD in 2011 by the NAACP, 1,000 units will now be dispersed in the most affluent areas of Baltimore. And if that wasn't enough to fundamentally alter the American landscape, Castro threatened to sue suburban landlords for discrimination if they refuse Section 8 tenants with criminal records. Uh, what, what do you think about considering Julian Castro as vice president? Well, I think really highly of him, and I am thrilled to have his endorsement today. Both he and his brother, uh, the congressman, are just among the best young leaders in America. Castro sucking up to Wall Street was seen as a potential toxic addition to Hillary's campaign. But now, with this dangerous scheme to once again bring government-leeching welfare recipients and criminals into the left-wing perception of two white, white flight, quiet suburbs of America in the name of fighting inequality, has the potential of placing the American dream squarely over the toilet. John Bound for Infowars.com. And welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Joe Biggs, and today we have a very special guest. We actually have Carl Higby, a former Navy SEAL, whose book just came out yesterday, Enemies Foreign and Domestic. And joining with me in studio is his co-author, Brandon Caro. Thanks, guys, for being here. All right, thanks for thanks having for us. us. So, Brandon, uh, you got involved with Carl Howe. Tell us a little bit about that. So, uh, we're both from the same town, Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, we actually both went into the military around the same time, 2004. Uh, and this was years later, I guess it was like 13 or 14, something like that. And we have a mutual friend and I was out to dinner with her and she, I didn't know Carl at the time, but I, but I knew who he was. And she was like, did you hear what happened to Carl Higby? And I was like, no, what happened? And she was like, oh, well he got, you know, dishonorably discharged. That's what she said. Obviously that's not what happened, but that was her interpretation or her understanding of what happened and I was like for what you know what did he do because you know I, I served also I'm a veteran uh, and I realized that to get a to have your discharge downgraded it's a very very serious thing so I was like what did he do and it, and it usually is about conduct you know you did something wrong you behaved inappropriately and she was like well he went on Fox News and he he uh, made critical comments about the Obama administration and I was like but that's not against the law you know. Yeah, but that's what we're seeing, though, right. here in Obama's America, that you can't be critical, you can't be honest, you can't tell people what's really going on because it could be offensive, sure. or it, it could actually pull back the curtain and show what's really going on yeah. with our government, with our commander-in-chief, or lack thereof. So that's what I want to get into, Carl. What happened to you, and what made you say the things you said? I mean, what, what did you notice with the Obama administration and your deployments? Well, there was uh, two fundamental issues here. I'll, I'll go out and first say that, uh, you know, the Obama administration, the amount of money and resources they spent to try to prosecute me, which they ultimately lost in the, in the long run anyway, would have been much better served to fix the problem rather than try to cover it up. But what, what really pushed me to write Enemies Foreign and Domestic was during my second deployment, I had a friend of mine get killed because of rules of engagement. He was a bomb technician and he was ordered to remove explosive material and it ultimately killed him. And it was against his better judgment. Uh, additionally, myself and my teammates were court-martialed for prisoner abuse after catching the second most wanted man in the world behind Osama bin Laden. And uh, we, we brought him back, not a shot fired. He bit his lip, spit blood on himself, and told our, our high-ups that he had been abused by us. Now, and that's the, uh, the Butcher of Fallujah, yeah, correct? Butcher right. of Fallujah. Yeah, patently false. And uh, so all that had cons uh, you know transpired, and what we did was eventually is they tried to generals mass us, which is non-judicial punishment. At that point, we requested a court martial so we'd have this thing called evidence in our favor <laughs> and uh, went to court, tried our case. We were all acquitted. 
And uh, I, it really pushed me into the political sphere to say, hey, you know, there's some serious technical difficulties with the military, the chain of command, and also up to the White House. So I published my first book, Battle on the Home Front. And uh, Enemies Foreign and Domestic, the second book, is a firsthand account of me taking on the administration single-handedly and uh, with the help of Guy Rushenthal, my attorney, who is now a state senator in PA, we were able to defeat them. Uh, they tried to take away my honorable discharge after I was already out of the military, and we, which is uh, wow, that's crazy. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's completely illegal. We took them on. We beat them in a five to zero appellate court decision in my favor, uh, re, you know, yeah. reissuing my honorable discharge and uh, making sure that we had all the good marks back in my record. So this is a this book is a true account of you know how to take on the thing right versus might. Uh, the little guy, David and Goliath, uh, coming through. And, and, and it's a message to people out there, and it's a message to the administration that we will not sit silently as a uh, as a populist. I mean, I, I'm, I'm so fascinated by all this because I was in the Army. I was in the 82nd Airborne, and I saw corruption at the lower levels. You know, I was asked to do things that were, you know, went against my better judgment. A lot of times I was like, you know what, I'm not going to be a part of this. And I was always curious, Is it, it was this happening at at your level, at that special ops and it's it's interesting to see all the stuff coming out now, you know, with Benghazi, 13 hours, hearing your story about this, how they're trying to change it. It's amazing how much corruption is going on and how much they are trying to cover up. It's incredible. And the, the funny thing is, is they are spending more resources, like I said earlier, trying to cover these problems up rather than just saying, oh, you know what, troops, if you're on the outer wall, maybe you should keep your guns loaded because the <laughs> yeah, <that> TTPs <right. laughs> wouldn't let us do that. You know, like, maybe you should just kill bad guys rather than try to win their hearts and minds. I mean, these are fundamental things that even the common person who hasn't served understands why yeah. can't the administration get through their heads? Yeah, I think when we were working on this book, we started working on it in early 2014. It was before the, the big ISIS push, in, mm -hmm. it was before they took Fallujah. Uh, and in the book, we talk about on Carl's second deployment, how they had intel on, on high level guys in the opposition in, in Al Qaeda and in uh, other terror networks that they couldn't get mission approval for. And now, in all likelihood, those people are members of, you know, the ISIS administration. So, so you feel that these guys are kind of helping hiding some of these guys to let them flourish? When we were over there in 2009, we began the pullout and the withdrawal prematurely. Uh, what happened was, is these, these targets that, that we were supposed to action that we were over there to get, uh, the Obama administration started ignoring them. They said, well, there's no more war anymore. We've won the war. We're bringing our, thing, our troops home. The fact of the matter is, the enemy gets a say on whether or not you've won or lost the war, and they were not done yet. So we just left the job half finished, and uh, a lot of these troops were able to go back, and they're, they are the foundation of ISIS. They're you know, Saddam dissidents or uh, previous Saddam army people, and, and they're the fundamentals of why that region is devolving is because we let them go. We didn't go get them because the administration was too fairy-handed to want to go get them. Yeah, it's interesting. I, uh, Brandon shared an article with me the other day uh, about some other things you're dealing with as well in your in your own personal life. Tell us a little bit more about that as well with uh, regards to guns and all that. Well, actually, there was a there was an article recently published in the Washington Post is what you're talking about. Um, I was you know, I was separating from my uh, my ex-wife. And you know, the, the, the fact is, I don't want to demonize her. She's the mother of my child. But what she did was in an emotional feat was try to ban me from owning firearms around my daughter. I have a no criminal record. I'm a poster child for the NRA. And uh, I fought it tooth and nail. And the fact is, it was originally a judge that upheld it and made an emotion, you know, took her emotional plea and said, you know, I don't want him to own guns around the child for the sake of, you know, the better judgment for all. And we challenged, we won. Now, the problem here is that when you have somebody who's trained like I am, or even if somebody who's not trained like I am, there's no just cause to remove firearm rights under the Second Amendment, Article 1, Section 15 of the Connecticut Constitution, and also local state laws. I wasn't doing anything wrong. And this was a big challenge. And I think the Second Amendment is being greatly challenged in the family courts. It's being used as leverage to, uh, over custody for fathers. And uh, mm -hmm. we fought and we had Rachel Baird. She's a, a big time attorney for the NRA. We also had a Beverly Krieger who stepped up and really took this case by the horns and said, you know what? You, you can't remove someone's right to drive just because they um, you know, may have had an accident. You can't, definitely can't remove someone's right to own a firearm simply because it's an emotional fee, plea. And it's being done across the country, but we need to make sure that this is precedent now because we, we set, the, set the tone says you can't do this anymore. Yeah, indeed. Well, since we are in a political uh, time right now, we have some elections coming up. You know, there's a lot of different candidates. Who does Carl Higby like? 
Well, C- Carl Higby, in all fairness, is a Donald Trump national surrogate. So I'm obviously a Donald Trump fan. I think he's the right man for the job. And I, you know, he, he doesn't mince words. He says what he means. He means what he says. And I think he'll do the right thing across the board. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I like having someone like this that's going to come out and not be politically correct and, uh, you know, smash through a lot of this stuff, bring a lot of these things to the forefront, the 28 pages, you know, uh, talking about, you know, hopefully prosecuting Hillary Clinton. She deserves to be in jail. She's one of the most evil people I've ever, uh, you know, heard of, seen that, that's a public figure. It's just astounding to see someone like that that's able to run for president uh, and the FBI is looking into her and yet people still will vote for her. You know, America can survive a Barack Obama. They can survive a Hillary Clinton or Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders. But what they cannot survive is an electorate dumb enough to keep electing these people who sell them down the river. You know, the the Democrats have been running on the fact that this is a racist nation for, oh, I don't know, you know, the last 30 or 40 years. The fact is, we are the least racist nation ever. And if, if there's anything racist about this country, it's the Democratic Party, the same party that you know, 150, 260 years ago, traded in a steady stream of housing and food in exchange for labor. Now, that same Democratic Party tr- uh, trades, you know, WIC, WIC cards, food stamps, and federal housing, so housing and food in a steady extreme or steady exchange for votes. We need to examine and do a history t- a check on which party stands for what. And I think that's what the American populace is forgetting. All right. Well, thank you, Carl, for joining us and Brandon as well. Uh, Your book just came out yesterday again. Make sure you go pick it up. Enemies Foreign and Domestic, A Seal Story by Carl Higby and Brandon Caro. So thank you for joining us tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Joe Biggs.